template module development to create a device agnostic design system. So um, we're going to dive more into this later on in the talk um, and how it can actually apply to your work and how you can use this definition. Um, everybody thinks as a, a template group just for a better word. It's probably, but what I'm talking about here is hiding and showing or appearing and disappearing. Stuff um, basically going on the screen and coming off the screen based on the device. So I'm using toggling and not full on that term. Resizing and reflowing is a little bit more um, straightforward. So that said, I'm calling everything responsive for the sake of talk and for the sake of clarity. Um, I do have one caveat. This. <laughs> So, I don't know if anybody here has actually played around with our results from 2000 and, uh, 2012 before the, um, all the elections on CNN. Technically, um, this was a, an adaptive design. So, just, uh, just to make that clear, we had three distinct breakpoints. We designed for three distinct breakpoints. Um, we had a 12 column layout. That's the one for 12. And that's for desktop and tablet landscape. Then we did an eight column layout for a tablet portrait and a four column layout for a mobile portrait. So we were very specifically designing kind of like for these handful of devices and scenarios. So um, this is technically adaptive, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about it later. Technically, this approach is already outdated. It made a lot of sense last year and last July when we started this project. But uh, right now if you Google content search, you're gonna you're gonna get a lot of articles on how you want your content and the flow of your content to determine your breakpoint. So um, that said, so this was kind of like to, to make it simple for us so we only had to worry about these these three different scenarios. That said that we only did was sort of simple. We definitely had our fair share of challenges, and um, in a situation with very high stakes and risks that were almost as high as stakes, but this was slightly less, so it made it all worthwhile. So when I say high stakes, so as you can imagine, the amount of traffic that we get, you know, gets on election night. Uh, election night is a very, very, very large revenue stream. So uptime and a good user experience is really crucial. Um, actually, I should say it has the potential to be a really high revenue stream for us. So we don't have any problem getting people to come to our site on election night. But if you think about it, we have 16 other big competitors that have pretty much the exact same data. So in a lot of our users, they're going to CNN and then they want to share the data. So then they go to NPR, New York Times, and ABC. And as soon as our site's user experience or you know, the site's going down because traffic is too high, then they're just going to stick with another site that has a better user experience. So it's really important for us to give that good experience um, on that one specific night. Uh, so the risk. So last July, like most industries in the summer of 2012, and probably still a lot of industries, everybody on our team was completely new to response design. And so we decided to do it for this night where we had all these very high stakes and a very, very strict deadline. <laughs> that deadline is not going to move for us. Um, so we were all kind of new to this. We were all sort of figuring it out as we went along. And, um, and some people on the team <coughs> were also kind of new to American government. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> figuring that out um, as, as they were going along. <laughs> so yeah, there was there a deep learning curve. There was a deep learning curve for responses and also for the actual material and the complexities of the data that, um, that we were working through. And, um, and in addition, the, uh, the US designer on the project uh, got put on the project one week before development started. So um, a lot of that had to happen really, really fast. And we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit more about that. But despite all that, 
Look at all those smiling faces. <laughs> that was election night. So this is part of my team, and those people are really genuinely happy. So had absolutely nothing to do with the turnout of the election and who won the election. It was that that we won the election. So that was really really cool. We um, it was a good night. So second highest paid team in history behind election night 2008. So 2008 was kind of a short election. So. Uh, I'll take seconds. That's that's pretty cool. Um, basically, all of our quantitative numbers we met or exceeded our goals, and you can see there's some really cool statistics up there. One 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 hundred and one million views. So it was pretty huge. Um, but for me personally, the biggest satisfaction came in that the user experience it held up. It held up against our biggest. I go back and I look at it, of course there's tons of things that I would change and that I cringe at now, but it was um, it was it, it was good enough. It actually it worked well for people to get to what they wanted to get to and they stayed on our site. They were coming and they were staying there. So that was really, really cool. And on top of that, viewers besides associative press, study associative press um, did make a response with elected experience that I think still do NPR and I think some other news organizations as well. Uh, we were the only news organization that created our own uh, cross platform election experience. So, um, of all the other sites that on election night I was going back to, but if you think about it, I couldn't do any sort of competitive analysis. I mean, everybody had their cards held close, so it was only on election night where I got to see what, what New York Times was did and what NPR did and what all the other competitors did. So I was I actually did a screen capital and I'll hopefully post it at some point. But um, nobody else did a sponsor. So it, it was a big challenge and we we really did pull it off. So okay, so I talked about terminology and like kind of cleared it up, muddied the waters a little bit, and I went through some of the successes and challenges of elections. So now I actually just want to impart some tactical advice on lessons learned and through going through the project. So I want to talk to you about um, two things. So this is a metaphor. I'm not actually going to talk about unicorns and leathers. Um, yeah. But um, so two things. I want to talk about I think chasing unicorns and leather. So first, this idea of chasing unicorns. So unicorns are a symbol for the ideal, right? There's this unattainable ideal that sort of only exists in your imagination, but it's still worth hunting down and striving for, right? So this concept has even been manifested in an internet meme. I don't know if you guys have seen this, right? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love it. Um, always be yourself, and unless you can be a unicorn, then always be a unicorn. So to me, this means always be yourself, unless you can be better. And if you can be better, then go ahead and be better. So this idea of a perfect responsive design process, I mean, it's out there somewhere. It's like that um, that idealistic unicorn. Um, and it may only ever exist in our imagination and never in reality. I feel like there's value in striving for that ideal, understanding that ideal, visualizing it, at least attempting to track it down. So I know in the wild it can never exist, but let's, let's at least paint a picture of what that process would look like. So, whoop, that's 14.5. You don't have to read this, um, but we're just going to kind of go through it at a high level. So as I said, I, I really do. I geek out on the design process. It's really interesting for me. And for me, this is this is my unicorn. Um, so I want to I want to share it with you guys. So for me, a great process is first the process that, that helps you and doesn't hinder you. It actually makes your job easier. It allows you to become more creative instead of like fitting you into a some sort of mold. So and I think that process is important for all design projects. And actually, the process that I'm going to go through here is sort of forced through my seven years as a designer and then through the going through the election 
talked about the last year and the lessons learned from that. But it really, it, it's geared for responsive, but it would work for any time and any project. Um, so I think that this is really important for not only for every project, but especially for responsive design projects, because there's so many complexities that come along with it. It's really important to have a good iterative process. So if you Google responsive design process, there's a lot of stuff out there. There's a lot of really good stuff out there, and I would encourage everybody that is in the middle of a responsive design process or thinking about doing it or just really interesting reading. So uh, but you get you get a lot of uh, really great points on tools to use. Like there's um, a lot of people that are trying to use InDesign, which is like an InDesign stick you can do like the multiple layouts and um, there's also a good one on using Fireworks and Evernote together to create design libraries and, and actually using Keynote too. Or a lot of people are saying now that all of UX designers kind of need to become front end developers to be like dark prototyping in the browser and doing HTML and CSS. So there's all this really cool information on how our process is changing that, like how we need to wireframe differently. And there's a lot of value in that because I use I use Actor for a lot of I did three different wireframes with three different breakpoints and it was a total mess. So there has to be a better way to do it. Um, if you Google it, you'll also find um, a lot of information. You'll find like these uh, really cool graphics, like this four to six steps, and like even a circle in the middle. And you look at it and go, like, wow, yeah, that looks really great. But then it doesn't really almost too simplify it to give you, it just gives you that really broad picture, but not any of that tactical advice. There's also a lot on mobile first and content first. That's all really, really good stuff. But for me, I still feel like there's a gap. And this gap is on how to actually think and design in this modular, templatized way. So this process that you see here is sort of taking the best of my, my book knowledge on process and my, uh, my experience and then also looking back at all the things that went wrong with elections and how I would like to do them differently. And, um, and I didn't actually do the sort of structural integrity test of it and looking at other design processes. So like Jesse James Garrett's design process, strategy, scope, structure, skeleton, and surface. Not to that, it's got all those elements. Um, ideas process, their here create, deliver, human-centered design process, their very easy and acronym. And uh, Bill Buxton's sort of converged diverse, converged Christmas tree thing. Um, not for that too. So it's got all those elements. And um, so let's just talk about what, what we're looking at here. So this, we have columns, and we, I know you can't actually read the title. We're going to um, zoom in on a couple of key features here. But we have columns, and we have color codes. So in the columns, columns represent sprints. So sprints, if anybody is familiar with agile, with agile process vernacular, and basically a sprint is an iteration. It's a chunk of time. Usually they're two to three weeks, but depending on the size and complexity and also visibility of your project, you could have a sprint that's three hours, and you could do the entire process in less than a week. So um, you sort of scale your sprint, and then you go through these steps. So these are basically steps in the design process. So those are our columns. We have three work is kind of stuff that happens before the official kickoff. Uh, where all the business people are figuring out what the hell is going on. And then you put zero in the kickoff, right? And then it's very, very heavy, we're going to talk about the color plate, it's very heavy on the UX. Sprint one is when development starts. Sprint two, second week or second sprint of development. And then sprint three plus, once you get to sprint three, those cycles should start looking very similar. So sprint four will be probably similar to sprint three. Or if things are really screwy and your design isn't working out, then you might iterate back around to sprint one or sprint zero. And then at the end, you cap it off. You have an option to get to sprint to pick everything up before you want. So those are the, the sprints across the columns. And then so our color coding here. So across the top in gray, that's collaboration. So you'll see in three work, there's a little bit more heavy on the collaboration. And then it's basically just representing meetings, like what kind of meetings do you have? So who is reviewing the three work? Um, blue is business. So again, 
can be on the um, pre work side, and then they kind of go more into a, a review and support role. Rear and QS, this is where we're going to be talking a lot about for all the other people here. So, Rear and QS, you can see there's um, definitely as much as possible being involved in the pre work phase. Um, usually, we're sort of cool with that about. So it's kind of like, the, oh, so the bar is also represented by the effort, too. Um, and very, very, our results of our efforts in the Sprint Bureau before development starts and then sort of tapering off as development um, ramps up. Orange here is visual design. So visual design working closely alongside UX. And then um, red or pink here is development. You can see that kind of they're more an advisory support role in the beginning and then their level of effort maxing out at the end of the process. So this is actually not look so unfamiliar or not sound so unfamiliar. Um, this idea of business and UX uh, heavy on the front end and then sort of tapering down and and, um, and development ramping up as time goes on and having more of a a graceful transition from teams instead of having, okay, we're going to design here and then we're going to develop here. Um, that, that shouldn't seem so unfamiliar. So what exactly makes this different in design? So a couple things uh, that I want to highlight here that sort of really uh, come, come out of the, uh, the, the tweet that we ran into last, uh, last year with elections. So first and foremost, as much as possible, that you kind of guide your business growth or you're creating business requirements, making sure you get one business requirement document. So I don't know if your company has a mobile team and they want to make a separate set of requirements. Yeah, one one requirement document, and those requirements should be completely divided by numbers. We don't want the business folks saying, well, this is how it should work on desktop and this is how it should work on mobile and this is how it should work on a tablet. Those should be your creative decisions. So as much as possible you can kind of coach um, your your business folks to really um, take the problem and the need and not the US solution because once you start deciding what goes on what device, that is those are US solutions. Of course as always you want to make sure that your requirements create that the big picture goal, um, you know platform requirements, this is the idea of actually you want to not only design mobile first, but get your business folks to be thinking mobile first and content first. Um, and so you know hierarchy and priorities. You know, this should go next to this and this should you should be able to get to this from that. Um, also make sure they're not trying to draft business requirements from a soon to be legacy, non-responsive site. Yeah, <laughs> this is gonna be in trouble. Um, <laughs> And also, do not try to uh, partition and plan your sprint based on your business requirements. So, um, I'm not going to get into too many of the, the nitty gritty details here, but basically, business requirements were written, they were summed up by template and page. Sprints were planned by template and page. I got a hold of it, and I basically had to pair all those to do the process of that together. So, um, because they were written off of this non-responsive 2008 site, so those templates didn't exist anymore. They all had to be changed around. So, moving on to the aspects of the Sprint Zero. So, this is where we start getting into playing with Legos, and we're actually going to dive a little bit more into this. Um, so, playing with Legos. So, Sprint Zero, you'll see that time two, and Sprint is actually a little bit fatter than the other Sprints. So, as much as possible, Try to advocate and like fight to the death for a big, solid, long sprint zero. Um, I had I had two of a sprint zero, um, which got a visual mod template. Again, this is important for any design process. You want to have as much upfront time as possible to do a lot of planning and thinking through before um, before development starts. So it's really important, especially with responses, to get that good sprint zero. Um, I went to hear the ice at Sparkbox. I don't know if you've heard of Sparkbox. They're consultants that think out of Austin or something. Yeah. Sparkbox. Okay. They do a lot of responsive work and um, they have some of those 
flip process diagrams from Google responses that desired. But I um, I heard them talk at the Unit staff conference last year, and they said that your first responsive design project is going to take 100% more time than a regular design project. Remember, you're getting a lot more bang for your buck, but it's going to take twice as long. The second one you do, once you kind of get into the rhythm of it, it's going to take 50% less time. And then the next one is going to take 25% less time, but then you kind of level out, and it's still always going to take a little bit more time because of the inherent complexity. So, um, and you just need to make sure that when you're selling it to your business or whoever you have to sell it to your client, um, your executives, that you make sure that they understand what they're getting. But if you put 25% more time in and you get the cross platform experience, so it's worth it. But that extra time is happening right there. Okay? It's happening at that sprint zero. That's where you need that padding. So, as much as possible, you've got to give yourself time. To play with Legos. So, playing with Legos. A um, couple things you want to do untangle your basic user flows, which is something that, of course, you always need to do. Identify your least common denominator. Uh, uh, template. Identify your least common denominator template that can be applied to step three user flow. Uh, you. Um, identify your least common denominator modules to get to carry out business requirements. Create a priority prototype for each template, so basically a list of modules for each template. And also consider navigation in a full site map across platforms. So, sprint one is kind of the second part of this. Um, you guys know what part of one here, but you need to do you also want to identify your least common denominator elements to use for each module. And we're going to define templates and not own elements in just a second. So refine user flow to determine the rules for response for modules. And if you can, you can paper prototyping or uh, paper user testing, mobile first. Um, and then the last thing I want to highlight on this slide is wireframing. So wireframing, whether it's you your front end development skills or working really closely with the front end developer, uh, mocking up your least common denominator templates, placeholders, modules, and multiple concepts for navigation in the browser in JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. So, all this stuff here you can be doing with diagrams, whatever you're most comfortable with. If it's InDesign, fine. If it's Spyro, it's fine. If it's Illustrator, it's Attacker, Tom Grapple, whatever. But really get in that core system worked out, and then start doing your mock-up mobile first with the developer or with yourself in the browser. A little bit more on playing with Legos. <laughs> so, um, a little bit of trivia uh, on Legos. So Legos is derived from Danish word. Uh, Lego, meaning play well, and the word Lego can also be interpreted to mean I gather together in Latin. So a set of words that can't be really happy if they really kind of round off the Lego metaphor. And <laughs> the more you think about a responsive design project with gathering up blocks and playing really well with them, the better off you're going to be. So a responsive system is made up of three components. We have the modules, which you can think of them as the actual Lego. Those are the building blocks that build your beautiful castle. Um, then you have templates, which are kind of the canvas or the foundation that you put your Legos on. And then the elements, and this is where my metaphor breaks down just a little bit. Think of the elements as a little, a little nub. <laughs> but really, it kind of works because the elements are the things that sort of hold everything together and, and make it work. They're like the drop down, the buttons, they're the atomic, most atomic pieces. Those are the elements. And we're going to talk a little bit more about all those before we wrap up here. Um, so, those three elements, there's basically three ways. There's actually a fourth way that I haven't thought of, maybe we can talk about it. But three ways that I can think of to sort of play with these three, these three kinds of components. It's refiring, reflowing, and toggling on and off. So it's going to be your job to identify what components you need 
what templates, modules, and elements simplify those as much as possible, and then define those rules and interplay between them. So, talk about templates for a second. So, these are the we had for um, for election election 2008. There were nine or ten different page types. Boiled that down to four for 2012. So these are our four different templates. So templates, templates are, it's kind of hard to describe. A template is applied to a page. Page connotes hierarchy and user flow, right? You can kind of separate this idea of template and hierarchy. So a template is sort of a starter kit that you apply to a page. And really in the beginning, it starts out as kind of a container for your basic Objective, what happens on each step of a process. So for elections, we have four templates. We have race of name, which is your, your basic page, your, uh, your landing page, your snap hub of elections. We have race hub, which is everything about a single race. A state hub, which is everything about a single state. And a state race detail, which is sort of the intersection of those, which you've got down to your county level details. So those are the, those are the four templates. But then like, take a look at race hub, but it's times five. So race hub was actually applied to five different pages. There were five in the same page name. And that race hub, there was one for president, one for Senate, one for house, one for governor, and one for ballot measures. So some of the modules on that page had their own, of course, there was some different data, of course. And um, for example, our balance of power at the top was different on each page. But it was still, it's still a race hub. State hub. 50 plus state hub pages, one state hub template applied out to all these pages. So we have some, uh, we have some like, sub templates. We have our, um, our battleground state. So our battleground state, they have little special treatments and they have some swing on them. They have a little drop down that pulls you out of the battleground state and, and some other cool stuff there, but it was still a state hub. So model. So we have four. Templates, we only have four modules here. Of course, there's a lot of complexity embedded in all these modules and instantiations that change a little bit. But in the beginning, we were just thinking, we were just playing around with these four templates and these four modules. We just had to figure out well, what, would, what exactly would we need, create a module as sort of a bucket for that at a really abstract level, and then we could start moving those pieces around. So we had our balance of powers, which are basically a summary of the race, like a president. Uh, President, head of war, a Senate balance of power, um, to give you some examples there, we have one for every race type. Really, we just thought of this one module, at least in the beginning. We had maps, we call them mega maps, because they have tabs that you can go through and see the results of the different races. We had over here, this far corner, is, um, we had race tables. So again, hundreds and hundreds of race tables that really just think of this as one module. And we had exit polls. And the polls had to give you a graphic view of the other tables, but it really is just four modules. And then elements. So, of course, we had, we had dozens and dozens of elements. So, these pieces were not necessarily static pieces, but you can see like I have Zach Georgia over there in the flyout. So, there was data coming in, there was flyout that moved around, but still, an element, because even though these elements can actually, the elements themselves, themselves, can reflow within their container, within their module. They can resize, right? And even hide and show problems. The elements, or sorry, tiny pieces inside the element isn't gonna, there's not gonna be any of that fuzziness, right? There's not gonna be any disproportionate resizing. There's not gonna be any reflow, and there's not gonna be any hiding and show, because once you do that, then you have a module. So this is just, you have to, the point of the element is to have some point where it's the buck stops, right? Like, what, are, what is my most atomic level? So, well, so this page, okay. <laughs> so now that you've identified your templates, your models, and your elements, you have to come up with these rules of play. And this is one way I've identified to do so. Um, <laughs> what the hell is this? Okay, so this is, this is a matrix on track. It's a kind of early vulnerable prototype, so bear with me as I attempt to explain this out. Um, so, templates, I'm, I'm just going to read this right up, it's still, it's like a, 
have blown my head. So simplest modulus elements can be designed by how they toggle, reflow, and be static. But for each of these components, we have to think about those rules at the macro and micro level. So, the solid block is my icon for the macro level, and then the one with those two little boxes is my icon for micro level. Keep that in mind. So, for, let's take, start, start on the left side. So, for simplest at the macro level, okay, we have to think about how the actual templates play around with each other, okay? So, how do they toggle, reflow? So this this is your your user script, right? It's it's the the template at the macro level. That's where you're thinking about your user flow. Templates at the micro level, you're thinking about how the objects, the modules inside of the template are moving around. Okay? And what and how they are responding to the different devices and different grids. Modules at the macro level are how the how the modules are responding within their container to templates. So those, those two things have to be the exact same scenario. Modules at the micro level, sorry guys, I'm just pointing at some stuff. Um, modules at the micro level are, we have to consider how the elements inside the module are moving around, how they're reflowing, how they're resizing, and how they're toggling. Elements at the macro level, same thing. How how are they how are they moving around in their container? And elements at the micro level, well that's really we butt up against our, our definition of what an element is. That's why you can just know what it is. They don't do any of that stuff. So I'm going to talk through some of this stuff in this matrix and then um, then open it up to questions. <laughs> so okay, so let's go through this toggling row. So the reason it's such a circle there is this idea of um, our good friend Luke W. And I, the jury is still out here, but there's a lot of experts that are starting to say, and I wholeheartedly agree, that this idea of mobile context is really overblown. Oh, overblown, I think, is the, the, the word that, that Luke used, actually. Um, it's basically putting out some kind of a myth, the idea that we need to hide stuff, or that we have this this like on go user and they just need like the top three functions because they're on the go and they're, you know, it's like it's, it's, no, somebody is sitting on a train and they want all the functionality that they have on their regular site. So I know this is true for me. PayPal app is really, really bad about this. Like you, you don't have all your functionality. You have to go and you find the list the full site where they can log in again and find out what you actually have to do. So that's not to say that it can't happen. There, like we did it in elections. There were some pieces with the amount of data that we were having to show that we had to hide. So, for example, in that um, in our race table, we had a column for percentages and we had a column for actual vote count. On mobile, it's just too much data to actually fit you know, on the mobile width, so we dropped out the vote count, which is really not really that important. On the other hand, we actually we didn't show counter results because that was it was a uh, requirement that came from the mobile business requirement. Oh, our mobile users they don't they don't need to see the counter results. And record that we definitely should have had our counter results in there because we actually had to, had to kind of work around and change our information architecture because we were hiding all of that stuff. So the point here is yes, definitely. If it can happen, you might want to be hiding and showing something just to be really judicious on what you're hiding and showing and keep in mind that this idea of mobile context is a myth and that you, you want to give your users as much functionality as possible. And if you are starting from a mobile first perspective, if you're designing mobile first, you shouldn't have a problem with that. Um, and reflow. So reflow is simple to the macro level. Um, the reason that there's a maybe there is because when you're when you're going from a mobile first flow to a desktop flow, potentially you could be combining them. Right, so your flow or your navigation, depending on how your navigation works, also your flow might change a little bit. Um, for uh, modules, modules at the micro and the macro level, yes, definitely, you're going to be reflowing. Um, and 
going down to the B side, row here. That was definitely a resizing, and like, this is why we're doing all this stuff, because our templates are, are, are resizing. Um, and then modules uh, at the macro level, yes, they are resizing, but probably because the elements inside are doing some shifting around and resizing. Um, so, this diagram here, basically, what I want to pull out of the, my look around is 30 seconds. That side over there, that's <laughs> away. <laughs> <laughs> I can't see that. Um, no, I uh, the room. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so, that side over there, the, 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 the elements at the micro level, it's really going to be your visual design library and your details interaction. It's going to be handling like that. And over here with your templates at the at the macro level, to me your user flow. It's this stuff here in the middle that when you're sort of figuring out how these modules are going to work, that you're going to have to really look at and define how they work on these two levels. So I have this responsive module worksheet. So um, here basically it's looking at how the links on the inside. You can see the simplified version that we were just looking at. And basically, it's just a, at, on these three levels, at the micro and the macro level, how do we define this? So, for a quick example, we're going to take our rate, the, uh, the, uh, the rate table, and, and fill it out. So, probably, no, we're showing it every day. We're not hiding it for anything. Um, but internally, at the micro level, yes, some stuff is hiding. So, the state icon goes away. Uh, the first name. And uh, for the candidate who dropped the first name, so we can hit it on the screen. And that number of votes all were also taking that away. So last time on your team, if you did not have one of these worksheets, and in retrospect, it would have been really, really cool to be able to sell it directly to the developers because all this information was just sitting in the wireframe. It was like this, like, like you just read the afterthought. Um, reflow. So no, these are always in the stack scenario. You don't have to worry about any reflow. Um, reflow internally at the micro level, yeah, the status icon actually moves up. So I'm probably the more details, but yes, status icon moves above something or other. Um, Resize, yes, all of these things. And um, yeah, we are, are also scaling our icon space. So finally, final thing I want to say is this is basically US decisions to do this modeling, right? This is mostly in US as can. Reflowing is kind of a combination of visual design and US working together. Resizing, as US designers, I don't think we need to worry too much about that as we do more in our, our graphic designers' counterparts can. And a lot of that reflow and resize is visual design plus the system, right? Or the responsive nature of it and how it ends up flowing. Um, flowing. So uh, this is actually probably a lot of the systems moving the stuff around and our graphic designers doing some QA and seeing how it works and tweaking it based on um, lots of testing and data devices. So finally, I would love to talk forever on how this is good for your company and how to sell it. Um, how it's good for your career. Uh, this is still really, really new stuff. The more you can jump on it, the more you're kind of on the cutting edge. And good for your brain too. It's a really great workout. So thank you.